Okay, now some of these books are uh, neglected and out of print and hard to find. And examples are Brian Geisen's The Process and all the books of Ben Welsh. And some of the books like Jaws 2 and Nightcomers are listed not for any intrinsic worth, but because they illustrate a literary trend. Uh, Jaws 2 is not written by Benchley, but uses the character, the characters from Jaws 1. And Nightcomers retells the turn of the screw by Henry James, using James's characters. And the, actually the whole concept of originality is now, as it were, officially dead. You don't need new ideas or new characters. And if the writer uses sets and characters from another writer, his work will be judged on its own merit. Uh, neither of these two books, incidentally, seem to me successful. Now, some of the books are listed because they contain a few good pages. And a film of five good minutes is really a good film. And the list is not complete, and I'm working with uh, Ann Woolman and uh, Larry Fagan and others, and we intend to keep adding to the list. And no doubt I will be adding books during the next three lectures. And I hope some of you will suggest books that should be on the list, one reason or another. And I, I can remember some good books I read years ago, but have forgotten the name of the book and the writer. And I hope that eventually the book will be sort of a Baedeker's guide to the arts with stars and ratings and inspectors. Now, I notice that the course is listed here as creative writing. Actually, it's creative reading. And when I have taught or attempted to teach creative writing, uh, there is, of course, an implicit assumption that the student can write, that is, put words down on paper. So I'm assuming that the students in this room can already read in the sense of being able to read words on paper. But being able to read creatively, to see what the writer is trying to do and how well he is succeeding, to spot plants and tricks, to devise alternative endings and continuations of the narrative, and to see the characters in other sets. Um, I don't know whether the film Apocalypse Now is out yet. Have any of you seen it? Oh, you have? Really? Where? San Francisco. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that is based on Heart of Darkness. And using, uh, I don't know if it actually uses the same characters, but it definitely is based on Heart of Darkness by Conrad. Now, in the, early, in the early days of the Vietnamese War, they had these um, CIA men in remote uh, outposts where they maybe had uh, 30, uh, 30 people, 30 partisans, armed partisans. And it was a very much a turn of the century situation. These guys out there that had set up a little um, uh, nucleus of power of course, that, that really ended when the war really got going. So I'd be very interested to see what they could do with that, uh, with Heart of Darkness and in a modern setting. That is a modern setting that approximate, approximates the setting of Heart of Darkness. And also, uh, to, you should know when a writer is cheating and how and why a book or d does or does not hold your interest and also the whole matter of what is known as style, which is a very mysterious thing. Well, this is, involves a lot more than just reading. Um, consider what actually happens when you read. Uh, I wrote and recommend a little booklet called The Book of Breathings on Egyptian hieroglyphs pointing out the difference between pictographic or calligraphic language and an alphabetical language like English. Now, reading an alphabetical language, we tend to lose sight of the fact that the written word is an image and that written words are images in sequence. Now, if you are reading an Egyptian hieroglyphic text, uh, it's quite clearly evident that you are reading images in sequence. 
Of course, there are arbitrary elements in Egyptian writing, uh, beginning with an arbitrary uh, alphabet. But, uh, and both nouns and verbs um, regularly contain arbitrary pictures. Here, for example, is the glyph for death, which is a man splitting his own head with an axe. And this is a determinative, a determinative indicating that the word pertains to death killing to an enemy. And you may be reminded of any number of self-destructive acts and biting your lip or spilling drink to a serious accident. But there's another picture in the glyph for death, and that is a horned owl. Now, these arbitrary pictures may be compared to what we call style in writing. They arise in the medium in itself, which must qualify in order to achieve any degree of precision. And style, then, consists of an arbitrary choice of words or images. The writer makes an arbitrary and therefore characteristic choice between two or more words with more or less the same meaning. Uh, let us suppose that Egyptian scribes may each have his characteristic owl, pretentious, mysterious, threatening, uh, whimsical, dejected, uh, stylish, qualifying uh, death. Um, as I said, I've had uh, occasion to doubt the validity of, of writing courses, but I think in reading, comments can be helpful, as I know from my own experience, as someone who's experienced uh, opinion I respect is recommended a certain book at a certain time, and time is very important, too. And I said, well, I looked at it and couldn't get interested. And then he said, well, look again. This happened with Beckett's Watt, and when I looked again, I saw what a really great book it is. In other words, a book that may mean nothing to you at one time may mean a great deal at another time. And that's uh, one of the purposes of this book list. You may find that you're your interest in one of these books at just the right time, that you intersect one of these books at just the right time, maybe months or years from now. And there's another very important factor that may interfere with your appreciation of a book, and that is uh, preconceived standards or expectations. You are looking for something in the book that is not there and lose interest when you don't find it. The book does not conform to your preconceived standards. Or you may have pre preconceived expectations. Now, some of, some of you may have classified uh, an outcast of the islands, and the same is true of Lord Jim as an old-fashioned novel, rather like Dickens, far removed from present-time realities. And you may fa fail to perceive that personifying the weather is not just a creaky old-fashioned device, but is here used, that is, I'm talking now of the outcast of the islands rather than Lord Jim. Uh, is used designedly to evoke a hollow cardboard world where white shadows play, play out charades of greed and selfishness and stupidity and corruption like so many animated cartoon figures. I think that uh, An Outcast of the Islands would make a very good film, but I don't see either Lord Jim and The Great Gatsby, the two books that I um, will be talking about in this course, as film material. Now, the written word is an image, and when you read words, you are seeing a film, a moving film made up of millions of associations. Just read a paragraph of Conrad. Here you see Almire leaning on the rail of his porch looking at the river. Now, the film you are seeing is made up of pictures you may have seen or imagined of such a jungle outpost. Of course, we aren't all seeing the same film when we read the same book. Uh, someone who had actually been to uh, the islands uh, would see a different film from one whose pictures of the area are all secondhand, are derived from the movies or the National Geographic uh, novels or paintings. And many of my own pictures of Conrad sets uh, derive from my personal experience of South American jung jungles. And similarly, someone who has actually lived through the 20s, as I have, will see a different film when he reads Fitzgerald from someone who has not uh, had personal experience of the Jazz Age. 
point is that when you read, you're seeing a film, and if you don't see anything, you won't read the book. Now, ask yourself exactly how this film is being evoked, how successful the writer is in making you see and experience what he is writing. Now, I'm postulating that the function of art, and I include in this category creative work in science, that is, creation in the widest sense, is to put us in touch with what we know and don't know that we know. You can't tell anybody anything he doesn't know already. For example, in the Middle Ages, people living on the seacoast knew the earth was round. They believed the earth was flat because the church said so. In the same way, when Cezanne first exhibited his pictures, the public was so incensed that they even attacked the canvases with their umbrellas. They couldn't see that these were pictures of apples, fish, uh, simply seen from a special angle. And it took Joyce's Ulysses to make people aware of their own stream of consciousness. The same thing happened in 1959 when Brian Geisen introduced the cut-up method. Now, the cut-up simply applied the montage technique to writing, which had been used in painting for more than 50 years. And these first cut-ups appeared in minutes to go. People were upset angry, especially critics and other writers. And we were accused of cheating. People felt that it wasn't fair to produce writing with a pair of scissors. Um, we were accused of plagiarism and of promulgating a cult of unintelligibility. Now, an artist sees something and puts it on canvas or paper or film, and at first the public does not see it. There is rejection, ridicule, and anger, and after a few years, everybody sees it. The cut-ups are now a more or less accepted technique. It was used in performance, and Anthony Balch, uh, a filmmaker of my acquaintance who uh, was one of the ones to use the, this technique, uh, showed Nicholas Rogue the film cut-ups and explained the technique, and pretty soon the expansion of awareness becomes common knowledge. Now, uh, In my creative writing course, courses, I suggest some exercises designed to increase the focus and range of awareness by making us aware of what we know and don't know that we know. Now, these exercises are equally applicable to reading. And like all exercises, they are not ends in themselves, but simply intended to develop habits of observation and awareness. Well, just take a walk, paying close attention to what you see and hear, and particular attention to what you are thinking when you read that sign, passed that person, saw that car. Now come back and sit down and write what you have just experienced. Now, you are examining a definite time section, and this will teach you something about the basic nature of time and events in time. You can carry the exercise further with a tape recorder, recording as you walk and then playing the recording back and placing yourself back where you were a few minutes or however long ago. And you're actually learning to travel in time. We travel in time all, all the time, actually. And, of course, you can also take, uh, take along a camera and take pictures. You do this for a few days, and you'll begin to notice that street signs, car license numbers, passing strangers are saying something to you. I can cite examples from my own experience. Yesterday, on, a, on my way back from the Liquor Mart, I was thinking of a book called The Wicker Man. I've been sort of reading that. It wasn't very good. But anyway, the protagonist is a religious policeman, a religious police sergeant. That's the worst kind, a religious cop. Uh, and this phrase in the book, book crossed my mind. I'm a police officer. When I ask questions, I expect answers. And just then, a police car cut in from Grove Street right on cue. Now, things like that happen all the time if you will just pay attention. And some people get very paranoid on this exercise. I remember one of my students saying, everything seems to mean something. Well, I said, everything does mean something. 
And you will notice that people seem to recur like they were on a conveyor belt. Isn't that the man I just saw in the grocery store? And there he is again and again. No, he's not following you. He's just in the same groove as you are. I recall in New York, I was up at 72nd Street, way out of my neighborhood. I lived downtown below Canal on Franklin Street at the time. So I decided to stop in a grocery store and buy a few things that I needed. In the store, I noticed a young man, and our eyes met, and we saw each other. When I got on the subway, he was sitting opposite me. And I thought, I bet he gets off at Franklin Street, and he did. Now, uh, this is synchronicity. There's no cause and effect there. We were both at the same place at the same time for the same reason. I mean, well, we weren't there for the same reason, but we both had the same idea that since we're here, might as well pick up a few groceries. Now, this happens all the time, but you won't notice it unless you see him or her the first time. Another exercise I learned from a mafia don in Columbus, Ohio, See everybody on the street before he look at you. Uh, well, if you do this, you see everyone before they see you. As a rule, they won't see you. You, see, you. you achieve a sort of invisibility, and then someone will see you. Now, notice that person. I recall I was doing this exercise, and on the subway, a Chinese looked up and saw me. Well, the Chinese are old hands at that game. Uh, you notice, you take, you take laundry into a Chinese... Uh, laundry and you go there once and he'll remember you and he'll remember the color of your laundry bag you can go into a wash shop man and 10 times 20 times they still won't uh, they just still don't know don't notice you thinking about something else now here's another exercise see yourself as a as a bodyguard maybe one of de Gaulle's bodyguards Instead of looking straight ahead, you're looking out to the sides, into doorways, into shop windows, and up at windows and roofs. Uh, you Here you are literally expanding your field of observation and awareness from straight ahead and more or less um, on one level, out to the sides and up and down. Actually, few people look up while they're walking and also look down, of course, into basement windows. Now, to apply these exercises to reading. Uh, you're examining uh, a section of time, and of course a novel is a section of time. And if it's a good novel, you will find that certain basic considerations about time and events in time is reflected. Uh, that is, well, you might call them laws of life. And here is one of the most important basic facts. Lightning always strikes twice in the same place. If you meet one rude clerk, that is a warning that you will meet another. Uh, the, first, the first time uh, gives you a warning or a notice of repetition. And that will apply to uh, good, good, good events or bad events. Uh, you know, good days and bad days. Any event will tend to reproduce similar events because events come in series. And that is the only law of gambling that has any validity, that winning and losing come in streaks. I mean, when you're... So the only law of gambling is double up when you're winning and quit when you're losing. Now, just as people recur in your field of vision... Um, the exercise, just as, yeah, this happens just as people will reoccur in your, your field of vision, so events uh, will reproduce themselves. The exercise teaches you some of the laws of repetition, recurrence, and synchronicity. If you don't see it the first time, you will miss the second time. You'll miss it the second time. That is, if you don't see, the, uh, see something the first time, you're going to miss it and miss a second chance. And both of these books are essentially about, uh, Lord Jim and the Great Gatsby, are about a second chance. Last year, I applied these exercises and considerations to a book by Stephen King called The Shining. Uh, how many of you have read it? Uh, yeah. 
Well, in this book, there's a warning of future events which takes the form of a word uh, seen in the mirror that is uh, backwards. And the word was red room. Well, how many of you immediately saw that this is murder spelled backwards? No? Well, it took me three days, I'm ashamed to say. Now, uh, hold the word patent up to the mirror. How many of you, by the way, have read George, Lord Jim? Oh, very good. Well, hold the word patent up to the mirror. It's a tap. And Jim was warned as clearly as a tap on the shoulder. Destiny, the hint's importance of things to come, is always there at the periphery of your vision. Um, if you don't keep your eyes open for the warning, the event will take you by surprise, as Jim was taken by surprise. Well, he complains that the whole thing is unfair. It came out of nowhere. But actually, he was clearly warned. Did you all notice where in the narrative Jim got his tap on the shoulder, his warning from Captain Destiny? Anyone? Well, here it is, right. Literally. On the lower deck, in the babble of 200 voices, he would forget himself and beforehand live in his mind the sea life of light literature. He saw himself saving people from sinking ships, cutting away masts in a hurricane, swimming through a surf with a line, and so, so forth, confronting savages on tropical shores. And then something happens. Uh, something's up. Come along. Uh, he leapt to his feet. The boys were streaming up the ladders. Above could be heard a great scurrying about and shouting. And when he got through the hatchway, he stood still as if confounded. Jim felt his shoulder grip firmly. Too late, youngster. The captain of the ship laid a restraining hand on the boy who seemed on the point of leaping overboard. And Jim looked up with a pain of conscious defeat in his eyes. The captain smiled sympathetically. Better luck next time. This will teach you to be smart. Absolutely clear warning of what uh, happened on the Patna. Now here he is on the Patna. Uh, he had unbounded confidence in himself. There was nothing he could not face. He was so pleased with the idea that he smiled, keeping perfunctorily his eyes ahead. When he happened to glance back, he saw the white streak of the wake drawn as straight by the ship's keel upon the sea as the black line drawn by the pencil upon the chart. And then the boat hits this, uh, probably a sea log wreck. And he's taken completely by surprise because he wasn't there. He was up floating around in some uh, visions of self-glorification from uh, fiction. He very much needed uh, training in, in awareness, a uh, seminar in Vipassana, being there. Uh, and this, of course, must go back to an earlier incident, probably in Jim's childhood, which we don't hear about. He is compensating for some basic flaw or fear. But he isn't facing the basic flaw. He is running away into fictional exploits, uh, as he does in the course of the book. And uh, there's a very definite comparison to the neurotic personality that is overcompensating for something lost. You can see his wife screaming from a New Yorker cartoon, what are you trying to prove? Jim has abandoned ship just as the neurotic abandons control of his own body and nervous system. Now, um, that is, he's overcompensating here for something. There was something wrong to begin with, and then he overcompensated for that with uh, these fictional exploits, and as a result, the actual emergency uh, caught him completely uh, unprepared. 
Now, actually, uh, he seems to have blacked out when he jumped off the ship. Uh, as you recall, he said um, the uh, what is it? The third engineer had collapsed and died, and Jim said I stumbled over his legs. And he was over here, and the next thing is he stumbled over this man's legs, not aware of having moved. And also, then he says, I had jumped, it seems. Marlowe says, yeah, it looks like it. But he apparently blacked out and didn't remember that. Just as the neurotic forgets the trauma itself and is left with the crippling results. And Jim had forgotten the jump itself, and only the disgrace and the dishonor remained, which he felt very keenly. Now, then it's... Um, Uh, we don't know the the basic fear in Jim's case. It apparently wasn't the fear of death or the fear of drowning. And uh, we must just look uh, for any clues. One is no time. No time to prepare himself. Uh, there is always a moment. Say the soldier is afraid, then he pulls himself together. But there is no time then uh, he may not be able to pull himself together. And for Jim, there wasn't any time. Um, so something he can never forget then becomes something he can never remember. And that is, at bottom, the same thing. Um, he couldn't remember having jumped, which means that he simply couldn't face uh, the... Thought, the th thoughts and feelings he had at that time. Now, he could have made, of course, to the court a simple statement. Well, um, we thought, and any seaman would have thought, the boat would go down in a matter of minutes. There was no time to save the passengers, and no possibility even. So we cut the boats loose and saved ourselves, and that's it. Now, he could have electrified the inqu inquiry board. After all, it was only gooks. Bunch of prayer mule and ala freaks. Take your certificate and shove it and give them the finger and walk out. <laughs> but Jim was incapable of that. Uh, just as the condemned man in most cases goes quietly to his death instead of articulating some memorable bit of insolence. And that would have been quite a different story and quite a different character. Um, as it is, in, in Lord Jim, he fulfills an incredibly fragile and romantic destiny, rather like the odor eaters in Tibetan mythology. Um, the cities of the odor eaters are fantastically shaped clouds which dissolve in rain and vanish very much like the mansion of the great Gatsby and Jim Spatusin. Now, Gatsby is no less romantic, but he's a hell of a lot tougher than Jim. Um, I'll go into that in more detail. But in any case, such destinies no longer exist. They are a natural resource, and we may blame both Jim and Gatsby for perhaps using up more than their share. As Gatsby in the last pages speaks of the last and greatest of human dreams. And both Gatsby and Jim only exist in the prose of the writer, which is one reason why. A fictional character and completely seen through the eyes of the narrator, Captain Marlowe. Now, there's a gap between Gatsby's rather absurd uh, fake gentleman, all this old sports stuff, and uh, the actual Gatsby that is never, um, uh, Fitzgerald really doesn't go into this at all. You see, Gatsby was not only in illegal business, but he must have been very good at it. I mean, you don't, uh, you're not playing in the league of someone who fixed the World Series without being pretty good. But we don't see this side of Gatsby at all. We just see him as sort of a, well, sort of a dope, you know, who rents this big house to Im impress a girl, uh, to impress Daisy. Uh, so Jim remains under a cloud. We never quite see him. And Gatsby remains uh, rather inane and um, almost stupid on the surface, 
and there's just occasional glimpse of a ghastly who was very shrewd and very competent indeed. But he is not, like Wolfsheim, immediately recognizable. You see, Wolfsheim has paid for his success with the outward marks of his trade, just like the skipper in uh, Lord Gem One Look tells you all you need to know. As Marlowe said, uh, I could imagine the type of people, he was talking about the skipper with whom he was acquainted. And one look at uh, Wolfsheim and you can see the shady deals, the World Series figs, black markets, hired killers, and so on. Uh, so both uh, Gatsby and um, Lord Jim are romantic heroes. Now heroes must die by and large, otherwise they, they, they lose their heroic quality. Imagine if Jim had been a bit duller if he had stuck to the ship, of course there wouldn't have been any story. I suppose he had stayed on in Patuson to become a living anachronism, photographed and written up in the newspapers. Or I suppose Gatsby had married Daisy. Here he is, a bit paunchy and drinking too much and putting on his tuxedo to attend some dull party old sport. A uh, spurious, inessential ghost, rather like the Duke of Windsor. So he would have lost his heroic quality if he had lived. Same is true of um, same is true, of Jim, of course. Um, now the universe of Jim is pretty. It seems quite remote from present time, as does the universe of Fitzgerald. And the um, it was a very it's a very fragile universe. But they're both very precisely placed in time. Uh, Conrad's uh, time there runs from about 1860 through the First World War, and Fitzgerald is even more definite from the American entry of war in, uh, into the war in 1917 through 1929. That is the only period in which Gatsby could have existed. As Gatsby himself could only live and breathe in the 1920s, and uh, Jim could only live and breathe in the... Um, in the 19th, I mean, yes, in the 19th century. So, clear Monet light of the 19th century. Now, both universes are not yet darkened by the atom bomb, nor are they illuminated by the uh, hope of space exploration, the possibility of transcending the whole human condition through genetic engineering or achieving immortality through cloning. Um, these didn't exist for Jim nor for Gatsby any more than the certainties of, uh, of that time. Fitzgerald's belief in the American dream as money and Conrad's implicit uh, belief in a fixed code of conduct. Um, both Gatsby and Lord Jim, on closer inspection, they're both very romantic and very much dreamers. They have a very definite dream, but this dream begins to look pretty, uh, pretty shabby indeed. The American dream looks like a 1920 party, and the 19th century dream of Lord Jim, the distinction of being white and so on, um, all the old colonial values, and um, you know, it, it, uh, this time it appears uh, pretty thin. Now, if these universes are brighter than our universe, they are also more limited, and they are both time-bound. And they are both uh, creations of the writer, uh, literally having their breath of life in the prose of Conrad and Fitzgerald, and they, therefore they both require the uh, midwifely services of a narrative, of a narrator. Now, this phrase, he was one of us, is um, quite mysterious. What does this mean? Does it mean simply that he was a, a likely lad to leave in charge of the deck? I think this is too superficial. Although his appearance is the immediate manifestation of his being one of us, whoever we are. Um, clear blue eyes and blonde hair and so on. 
Uh, one wonders if there's a reference here to homosexuality. And of course, the letter of the bachelor who takes Jim on as a, gives Jim a job for a while is certainly the letter of a snippy old queen, if I ever heard one. Let's see if I can put my hands on that. Um, So, when, when Jim leaves, there are no spoons missing as far as I know. I haven't been interested enough to inquire. He is gone, leaving on the breakfast table a former little note of apology, which is either silly or heartless, probably both. It's all one to me. Allow me to say, lest you have some more mysterious young men in reserve, that I have shut up shop definitely and forever. Do not imagine for a moment that I care a hang but he is very much regretted at tennis parties. For my own sake, I've told a plausible lie at the club. Ingrates, every one of them ingrates, obviously. Uh, well, as Fitzgerald refrains from looking at the other side of Gatsby, the Gatsby who actually conducted a very successful, uh, illegitimate business, a number of uh, very successful, illegitimate um, business ventures, so we don't have any uh, any glimpse of uh, Jim's uh, sexual uh, sexual life at all. And one wonders where some of these flights of fantasies was lifted him off the deck so that he wasn't in present time when uh, when he should have been when there was an emergency uh, were of a sexual nature. Um, Now, they were both um, and completely creations of the writer of the narrator. And um, they, don't, um, they don't have any uh, existence or reality apart from that. And to me, there is something highly unconvincing about the last section of Lord Jim, and also the same is true to, to some extent with Great Gatsby. I mean, this gentleman Brown, this character, uh, gentleman Brown, never comes alive at all. <clears throat> he is as much a paper character as Jim, but not being loved by the writer, he has less space and less credibility. If anything, I wonder if he wasn't perhaps. Um, um, pattern on uh, the actual John Brown because he, he, he sounds very much like that. You can see him with a Kansas twister behind him as uh, like some harsh and bloody prophet. And indeed, he's extremely self-righteous. But where exactly does he relate to Jim? I mean, he really seems to come out of nowhere, like there's no, uh, no relation between them. The, of course, he's got the relation with the skipper and the other people who were on the boat. They were literally all in the same boat. Uh, but where, where does this gentleman Brown come from? Well, possibly he comes from Jim's early readings because he's a typical villainous character. And uh, I think that uh, maybe Jim read about him somewhere. Now, both Lord Jim and Great Gatsby are essentially about a second chance. Um, I think uh, Caraway says to Gatsby, you can't repeat the past, and he said, but of course you can. And this, I think, is what he means by the last and greatest of human dreams, and of course what America was about was a second chance, the American dream. But of course, if Fitzgerald uh, lived on another uh, into the 60s, he could not have maintained this dream any longer. It's just no longer tenable. And, but they are both, both Jim and Gatsby, are very definitely time-bound and only exist at a certain time. Gatsby was a product of the 1920s of Prohibition, and um, um, Lord Jim of the turn of the century in the position of the white man in the uh, colonial world. The man that, uh, the only man that came to Gatsby's funeral says, uh, uh, took off his glass and wiped them again outside and in. The, the poor son of a bitch, he said. 
Now, uh, that was exactly what um, Dorothy Parker said at uh, Fitzgerald's funeral, which sort of ties up the identification of Fitzgerald and the great Gatsby. And both Gatsby's mansion and Jim's petition are equally fragile, the same uh, sort of quality, ephemeral, shimmering quality of a mirage just disappear at any moment. And of course, that's very definitely, uh, implicitly, the fact that both writers are chronicling a white world. And this is so basic they don't even think about it. It's, uh, I think um, Tom Buchanan is talking about the breakdown of morality and the fact that uh, first thing you know, whites and blacks will be coupling together and Jordan says we are all white here. Well, you can really say that again. They sure were. They both realized the, the dream, their actual dream, briefly. Uh, I think presumably Gatsby has it off with Daisy in a pile of expensive shirts. And of course, Jim's um, Patusen. Now we'll stop briefly for some discussion, and I'd like to read a few um, passages from illustrated passages from these books. Um, There really are so many parallels here that I'm sure that um, Fitzgerald must have read, must have read uh, Lord Jim and to, um, certainly was influenced by it. And um, there's a great deal of similarity there, both uh, these very improbable romantic heroes. Um, How many of you saw the either of the films? Hmm. Were they any good? Not the uh, Great Gatsby. Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that the Great Gatsby is film material. I mean, all of the whole point of it is in the prose. You take the, uh, for example, the last page of the Great Gatsby which is, um, I think, one of the finer uh, passages of prose in the English language. But how can you translate that into film terms? You can't, really. Um, except by the very um, unsuccessful device of having a narrator speaking over uh, the film, which just never works. I think they used that, didn't they, in The Great Gatsby? Yes. yes. Carraway, yes. Carraway actually reads this. He says it. Yeah. What was that last one? Pardon? What was that last one? Oh, that, um, well, you've got a passage, a prose passage, like the end of The Great Gatsby, but I don't see any way that you, that's a great prose passage. I think one of the, um, one of the great prose passages in the English language, really. But how can you turn that into film terms? I don't think you can. And most of the uh, the, the book, it, it, it obviously is not written to be a film. And I think the same is true of, of, of Lord Jim. It's, uh, I don't see how you can make it. Did, who saw Lord Jim out of the film? Uh, how was that? It's been years. Mm, yeah. It was Peter O'Toole, wasn't it? Yes. It was pretty poor because they were trying to get the images, image for image from the book, but they sent it out like a Yeah. Of the author, in fact, we were trying to get the book, we said 116 times, something like that, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, did it follow the book very closely? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the end, uh, where the uh, Doraman shoots him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the rhythm of it was very good. Yeah. Well, as I said, I can't see either one as a film, really. But um, I believe I, uh, I said at one time that the 
dialogue in The Great Gatsby is very wooden and stilted, but not altogether true. There's some very sharp dialogue, particularly from Tom Buchanan, who is a, a very clearly drawn, very limited character, particularly the, uh, the party in the uh, plot of, of, of Wilson's wife. There's some quite funny exchanges there. And um, I don't know, I think that the dialogue is, is pretty good, but the uh, the end, the whole, the whole bit of Wilson uh, shooting, uh, shooting Gatsby, I just feel it was very much, um, you know, hard to believe. And the same, and the same, I think is true of the end of uh, the end of Lord Jim. It just doesn't really con convince uh, convince one. I know. When I got to the end, or to the, uh, near the end, where um, Jim really begins to fuck up, that I found it very difficult to read on. Now, of course, uh, he fucked up in many ways. Obviously, he didn't know anything about power, the exercise of power. The first thing he should have done when he took over was to kill uh, Cornelius and the Raja. And uh, not to have done so, he isn't, uh, it isn't just himself, his own uh, ideals of, con of conduct that is uh, at issue there. He was endangering his friends, and he has uh, his remissness in that respect in leaving Cornelius alive, of course, led to the death of uh, Dorman's son. And also endangered Captain Marlowe himself. He had Marlowe uh, drinking uh, the Rogers coffee. Why well, this shouldn't have happened. So uh, he did definitely didn't follow through at all. And uh, the ghastly thing, the uh, w uh, Wilson just uh, coming in there just seems uh, not to have any. Um, any sort of validity. It's talking about parallels between the books, there's the last glimpse that um, Caraway has of, um, of Gatsby, his gorgeous pink, pink rag of a suit made a bright spot of color against the white steps. Uh, and then here in Lord Jim, the last, uh, Marlowe's last glimpse of Jim was uh, in his white suit, a speck of white. And then, uh, see if I can find that passage. But it is so strikingly similar that I'm sure that uh, Fitzgerald must have read Lord Jim and uh, was unconsciously or consciously uh, modeling me his uh, narrative on that. Yeah, here it is. The twilight was ebbing fast in the sky above his head. <clears throat> a strip of sand had sunk already under his feet. He himself appeared no bigger than a child, had only a speck, a tiny white speck that seemed to catch all the light left in a darkened world, and suddenly I lost him. It's, it's really strikingly similar, those two uh, passages, the last glimpse that the, narr that the narrator has of the uh, protagonist. And then uh, he speaks of that unfamiliar yet recognizable look that was back again on Gatsby's face. Well, that, that unfamiliar yet recognizable look is the Gatsby who uh, was engaged in all these uh, illegitimate uh, enterprises and was very, very good at it, indeed. And uh, every now and then, uh, Gatsby, who mostly sounds really just very stupid and very inane with his old sport and all his lies about tiger hunting and everything, uh, will come out with something very sharp, like uh, he says, uh, I mean, Tom, I mean, uh, no, here we are. Uh, 
Yeah, here we are. Yeah. This is, uh, they're all over at uh, Tom Buchanan's, and Tom is about to uh, uh, attack Gatsby, of course. Uh, and Gatsby turned to me, Richard, I can't say anything in his household, sport. Uh, she's got an indiscreet voice, I remarked. It's full of, I hesitated, her voice is full of money, he said suddenly. Exactly. I never understood before it was full of money. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it, the jingle of it, the symbol song of it. Uh, high in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. And uh, when it comes right down to it, the American dream, as uh, articulated by Fitzgerald, is just that. It's money. It's houses on Long Island and uh, big cars and swimming pools. Pretty, uh, pretty thin. Um, so I say that um, Fitzgerald would not have been able to maintain, to believe in the American dream if he had lived very much longer. Well, I have some questions and discussion on these books. I was reading them both for the second time, and I think they both read very well, reread very well. Uh, I think that's, uh, that seems to me to be one of the marks of a good book if you can reread it, or reread it any number of times. Um, how, how many of you were rereading these two books? Yes. How did you find that uh, they reread well? You really do. You really do. Yes. Well, did you? Uh, did you? Were you struck by uh, the parallels and similarities of the two books? Well, the romantic hero. The romantic hero. Yes. And um, well, of course, the, uh, the the whole matter of the dream. For example. Uh, it says of Gatsby, he invented just the sort of Jay Gatsby that a 17-year-old boy would be likely to invent, and to this conception he was faithful to the end. Um, we're not quite as clear as to just what Jim's uh, standards of conduct are, or what, uh, you know, what his uh, dream is. It's not, of course, as definite as Gatsby's. Gatsby had something very definite that he wanted. And Jim didn't, apparently. And actually, of course, his final, the uh, final denouement of the uh, Lord Jim seems to me rather, well, it's rather pointless. There was really no point in his going back and getting shot that I can see. Except that he, for some reason, as Conrad says, of course, this uh, that he was under a cloud, really, that you never really find out uh, what motivates him. There are a number, of course, of, uh, of loose ends in this book. The suicide of Briarly is, uh, remains very mysterious. I thought a lot about that, and I can't... Um, I can't see any reason for it, but almost as if the writer was cheating a little bit there. Um, does anyone have any ideas on that as to what could possibly have been? Uh... As a possible? Hmm? As a possible? Yeah. Just that Barry was the son that he never been caught in the car. He was cheating. I think that's the immediate assumption. Yeah. I wonder how right that could be. Yeah. Well, he also jumped, <laughs> jumped off the boat, yeah. But uh, I don't know, it isn't, it isn't made, uh, it isn't made at all, at all clear, it's very mysterious. But he was, yeah, he was very concerned with Jim, uh, with Jim. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I know they, they have some, a few of the reviews of Lord Jam in the end of this edition, the Pan edition. And um, they, they comment on that, the fact that Briarley's suicide is never really, never really explained. And of course, there's another, um, people said that no one could have uh, talked that long, that uh, Marlowe's representatives actually um, narrating all this. I, I don't think that's, uh, that's necessary. I don't think it's necessary to think in those terms that he was actually, um, he was actually talking. It was completely sort of uh, random. In the first place, yeah, Wilson was uh, it was the wrong man. One wonders because he was in one of those inflatable rafts. Why the bullet didn't go through and sink the raft? Things like that. But it just doesn't. Uh, uh, both books, it seems to me, are sort of inconvinc unconvincing at the end. I was never at all convinced by Gentleman Brown or that whole incident. It just seemed, doesn't seem to, uh, to really add up to anything. I think the same is true of the end of uh, Gatsby. Do you think Fitzgerald may, may have been some kind of, some way justified that Gatsby died in, in, in the book? Well, it seems that it seems that he would have to die. I mean, as I said, heroes—they don't die. <laughs> you know, what can you do with them? <laughs> I can't—I can't think of any other. But I, I just think that uh, that his death seems sort of fortuitous. Much more likely that it would, uh, you know, one of Wolfsheim's boys or something like that would have happened. Uh, yes. I wonder uh, if you knew that Fitzgerald wrote that in writing The Great Gatsby, one of his purposes was to use the same type of story structure that Conrad used in writing Heart of Darkness. Uh, no. Um, yes, he did. He called it, uh, Fitzgerald said that he called it a structure with a dying fall at the end. Mm -hmm. He put his page in the most beautiful prose at the end of the book which is what he thought kind of that part of darkness. And in starting the book, it was uh, partly because he had wanted to use that particular structure. Hmm. That's very interesting. So he did actually mention Heart of Darkness. Yes, he did actually yeah. say that. Yeah, well, I, I felt sure that he, that he must uh, must be, have been thoroughly uh, conversant with Conrad's books. But, hmm. That is, uh, that's very interesting. No, I didn't know that. What does he mean by, what did he mean exactly by a dying fall? That was just his phrase that he used, and uh, he explained this in uh, saying he suggested to Ernest Hemingway to use, and Hemingway couldn't find an ending when the sun also rises. I think what he meant was there was not an ending in the conventional sense of ending at that time where things ended. It ended, but then it went on and on, like the hero dies. Uh -huh. It goes on. It was that part after the hero died that he called the dying fall to keep down the and that's uh, what gave him the hint for his gas destruction. And he did speak specifically he uh, was awakened to that and uh, borrowed from the darkness. Wasn't that done by a dying fall? Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, something that somebody. I didn't, I didn't know uh, that he had said that. I, I made the comparison with Heart of Darkness. I, I read it in his letters. Both men what? Both Jim, both Jim and Gatsby were dreamers. In the beginning of the election, you were talking about synchronization Synchronicity. No cause and effect in a sense. And I think Gentleman Brown and uh, Wilson have the same tendency to the novel. And I think it was, in seeing my own previous uh, 
they do indeed. They, they, they seem like, uh, well, they have quite a lot in common. They both seem to just sort of uh, come out of nowhere. Very much so. Oh, and and the undoubtedly. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And it was. He's not leaving town. Mm -hmm. like, no, yeah. Even after seeing maybe Daisy flutter between Tom and he in the apartment that one afternoon, and people were so firmly in disagreement, he says, No, of course, I'm going to stay here. You know, how could I leave at this point after Nick asks him, How much did he leave town? Maybe he did get away. Yeah. And I find that the characters can just show up. The cost, the cost of the fact that they're finding isn't that important, but it's just the fact that Gatsby yes, is there waiting. Yeah. And I, I, don't know, I just found that to look out, and there isn't that much control. Jim didn't have the control, he didn't have the control not to go to the That's true, of course. So, of course, Gatsby had no, um, well, no reason to, to fear anything from the knowledge. He didn't know that this was happening. He didn't know that, uh, know anything about Wilson's uh, out to get him with the gun. Whereas, of course, Jim did know. But Wilson, and Wilson does seem this to, he doesn't ever convince as a character, either in his, or in his, um, his motivations, I mean, just seem to be you know, completely hidden. But at least in, I don't know, yeah, well, both he and Brown are, are both uh, a little bit crazy. There's that. Hmm. Any other questions or comments on these two books. Now we can uh, speak uh, briefly about some of Conrad's other books. Um, the Outcast of the Islands, how many of you have read? That was, I believe, his second book. No one? No one has read it. Uh, it's, um, there's nobody comparable to Jim. Everybody is uh, much simplified, much more simple, simple characters in that book. And the emphasis seems to be on the um, on the sets more than on the characters. But it would make a good film because it is essentially a, a novel of um, rather simple corruption. That this uh, character, Will Elms, is, um, falls in love with this girl which completely um, well ruins him he just uh, deteriorates um, under western eyes how many of you have read that by Conrad under western eyes yes. that I think is a, a very good book and would make a, an excellent film I will uh, I'll talk more about that in the next lecture when I have my copy, which is uh, being brought in from Cannes Print, my um, assistant is bringing it with him. I couldn't get a copy in, in uh, Boulder here. But um, there is, a, there is a, um, a book that I think would make an excellent, um, an excellent film. It has a, it is film material, whereas um, I don't think the Lord Jam is. It was not a, uh, it was very unsuccessful novel uh, when it first came out. I mean, unsuccessful from the point of view of, um, of sales and critics. But um, there's a superb, there's a superb passage in there that uh, the interview of Counselor McCoolin and uh, Razumov. Um, there's a great passage in Lord Jim here. I'm assembling uh, just passages that I think are particularly good from this whole list. 
And this would be uh, this passage of the uh, French naval lieutenant describing uh, his experience when he boarded the ship and so on is, uh, would be certainly one of those passages. Let me find that. And he, in a way, uh, seems similar to McCoolin, Councillor McCoolin, and under Western eyes, he has the same trick of leaving a, a sentence unfinished or conveying something just by his, uh, without moving or just by the flicker of an eyelid. Um, let me see. Said, because, mind you, all the time of towing, see, this is the uh, French gunboat that found the partner which didn't sink and towed it ashore. Uh, all the time of towing, we had two quartermasters stationed with axes by the houses to cut us clear of our tow in case she, and he fluttered downward his heavy eyelids, making his meaning as plain as possible. Councillor McCoolin has that same trick of, of leaving a sentence unfinished, just sort of looking down for a moment. This is it's just an extremely um, fine passage with the um, French, the translations of the French, and the way that uh, he he puts his finger on the the essence of this uh, affair. Says. That is it. So that poor, poor young man ran away along with the others. And then he has some uh, things to say about fear and the way that um, everybody experiences it. The necessity and of you know putting on a good face and of um, um, people around you. enables most people to overcome that fear. He said, man is born a coward. It is a difficulty. And then it said it would be too easy otherwise. It's very interesting. So, uh, that habit, habit, necessity in the eyes of others. And then uh, Marlowe says, that young man, you'll observe, had none of these inducements, at least at the moment, that he, he was completely alone. And uh, the skipper and the other officers were busy trying to launch the boat. There's some very funny passages in this, actually, particularly uh, when the, well, let's see, there's the, um, the third engineer and the second engineer and the chief and the um, skipper all trying to launch this boat. And uh, they're having all sorts of difficulties, and the uh, skipper refuses to get under the ship to try to get it loose. He says, I am too thick. And then the second engineer has to go down and get a hammer, and they finally do get the boat off. And there's some also the scenes in the boat are really quite, quite funny. It's not generally considered to be a funny book, but I think it is in those. Uh, yeah, those sections are very funny indeed. And there are also some quite funny sections in The Great Gatsby, mostly those involving uh, Buchanan, that is the party and uh, some of his dinner talk. He is, Buchanan himself is quite a comic character, I wouldn't think of himself in those terms. Yes. Are you familiar with the story called No Post in Progress? Uh, it's, it's a Conrad short story. It's mm -hmm. And the uh, last half of the movie, the treasure, was here. Okay. 
Yeah. On the street corner, two, two totally paranoid traders in the heart of the condo have a real gothic western shootout with each other. Because they think they're ripping each other off on each one. No, I haven't, I haven't read it, yeah. Might well have them have that. Yeah. But there, uh, there's some, some very, uh, he is, I, I don't think he's ever been appreciated as a humorist. But some of, uh, some, uh, some of this is very funny indeed. Have any of you uh, read any Denton Wells? That's, um, he's out of print. I think there are some, um, some of these books are in the library here. Pardon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he he is very uh, I think uh, extremely good writer. I'm trying to get him back in print. Some of the some of the books on this list have just recently come back into print, like The Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles, uh, put out by Echo Press. And that's um, I think it was out of print when I made the list last year, and it's now back in print. And also, um, Jane Bowles' complete works have been re reissued by Echo Press under the title My Sister's Hand in Mine. I'll have something to say about her. She's a very funny writer, indeed. How many of you have read any of Jane Bowles? I'll be talking about. Uh, Jane Bowles uh, next time, and also uh, Denton Welch. Well, any uh, further discussions or uh, questions? And also, if anyone has any um, any books to add to this, see, I originally uh, originally thought of it as sort of neglected books, but then it, it, it got beyond that, so some of them are uh, neglected and some of them aren't. Uh, some of them are um, are quite easy to find, are in print, and others aren't um, aren't in print and are hard to find. And that's particularly the, um, the class of books that I'm interested in adding to the list. But um, if any of you have any suggestions on um, books to be added to the list, I'd like to hear them. You notice I don't have many. Yes, what's that? Hmm? I don't know it. What's it uh, what's about? Well, by all means, put it down. I've got, I'm going to have many uh, science fiction books on here because that seems to me a very uh, difficult genre. There are very few science fiction books, I think, that convince you that it ever happened anywhere, or ever could have happened anywhere. And, uh, Again. Another uh, extremely difficult um, genre is ghost stories. There are just uh, very, very few that convince. I, I, I know I got down here a short trip home by Fitzgerald, and that seems to get left out of most of the anthologies. And it's one of the, I think, one of the best ghost stories in the English language. I think it was the only ghost story that he wrote. Uh, how many of you have read that story, A Short Trip Home? No, no none of them. It's hard to find. It, uh, it seems to get omitted. I don't know why. What about detective stories? Hmm? What about detective stories like uh, Brain Machine? Well, uh, of course, Rain. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, Raymond Chandler could be definitely on the list. Of course, 
he was essentially um, dealing in mythology. It has nothing to do with with reality. Um, and he wasn't. He was uh, well. Really, really, he was very much in the in the same line as um, as Dashiell Hammett. Mythological, a mythological detective story. Yeah, I should have some detective stories on the on the list. Although I've never been on, I, I've never liked this sort of Agatha Christie, um, you know, the the uh, um, Van Dyne, the straight who done it. Um, Bud. What's the name of it? Is it a what is this a novel or? Yeah. Well, if any of you have any books that uh, that you think should go on the list, we should write the write the books down and uh, pass them pass them along to me. I've got the the treasure of Sierra Madre on here. Now that uh, it's sort of axiomatic that um, uh, good good films are not made from good books. The treasure of the Sierra Madre, I think, was a much better uh, film than it was a book. Uh, but I read the book after seeing the film, and I found the book quite a disappointment. It didn't have the punch that the film had at all. I'm trying to think of a case of a really good book that's been made into a good movie, and I can't think of one right offhand. Can you? Hmm? What do you think of Women in Love? Of who? Women in Love. Oh, uh, that was uh, D. H. Lawrence. I didn't see it. Hmm? What? What? What movie? Oh, Slaughterhouse Five, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it a good movie or was it a uh, good movie? And the book. How about the book? Good book. Did you ever see a blow up of Julio Cortez? Yes. Yeah. Good film. Good film. Uh, was it a good book? Yes, excellent film. Uh, I think that they made a film of both um, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. I know they, they made a film of that, The Cars and the Colors. It was not a bad film, but to me, The Heart, the, the best thing in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter was the nightmare that this man had that they didn't mention in the, in the film. It was, it was a fair film. But... Um, by and large, I can't think of many good books that have been made in good films. I suppose it's the, uh, you've got a good, a good book that Hollywood considers to be a classic. They can't, they can't take the liberties but that you have to take with a book in order to make it into a film. Hmm? Well, uh, yeah, but those, you get something like uh, the Hound books, those, those are written like film scripts. Of course, this is getting to be more and more true that people write, uh, they, they really are writing film scripts. I mean, you take a book like, uh, like Jaws, which is, of course, nothing very special, but it's written as a film script. Any uh, competent film script writer can turn that book into a, into a film script in a week. That's true of many, uh, many books that are written now. You see, we, someone like Fitzgerald, he had obviously no idea of the film when he wrote this book. And it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Is it? And then you have, uh, um, well, books like, uh, books like Conrad, where you really have, would have to work to, uh, to find a way of making them into a film. So I say I can see an outcast of the odds, I can see under Western eyes as films.
but um, not not Lord Jim, not really. <laughs> See, a film, uh, I mean, even a very simple novel, you can't use all of it in a film. I mean, even a novel as simple as Jaws, they left out, they had to leave out a lot of the subplots. A film, you have to be able to say in one sentence just what it's about. And also, um, it has to be the film in which this and that happens. That's why people go to some sea films. This is the film with a mechanical shark. This is the film with a giant octopus. This is the film where the alien eats its way out of the guy's stomach and jumps onto the table. Have you, uh, how many of you have seen this alien thing? I like to see it. I read the book and I said right away, that's, that's the, that's the thing, man. That's, that's the, yeah, that's that's what's gonna they're gonna really do with the special effects, and that's what everyone says the film the film's about. It's about the alien it eats its way out of the guy's stomach. Well, it's you have to simplify like that when you're making a novel into a film, because that one was just written to uh, to be a film. Well, any further questions? Yes. I was wondering about in your own work, you decided to do that uh, film script of the Blade Runner. Is that to, uh, to sharpen? Well, uh, that is written as a film script, but it isn't a film script at all. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, it would uh, it would have to be a $100 million spectacular. You'd have to you know, tear down New York. I hadn't read the original, so yeah. I didn't know what no. was. No. It really, it, it, that is just as, as a form that I use there, but it really is not practical as a film at all. Now it was meant to be, be so. Did you write that in order to sharpen certain pictures? Uh, no, it's just, a, it's just a form. I, I did the same thing with the, the last words of Dutch Schultz, which really isn't a film script. I mean, it, uh, it's not a practical film script, no, it's, it isn't meant to be. Uh, well, I, I don't know. Um, a, a, a film project is never, never dead until you are, really. It's, uh, we had some backing and we lost the backing and uh, then there's talk of more, but, um, and then Dutch Schultz was batted around for about five years. So I just don't know. I mean, at present, it's more or less a standstill. There, there is still. The, I doubt it very much. I don't think of it as, as uh, really, really being uh, film material. I mean, it would have to be, as I say, very drastically simplified. You'd have to uh, concentrate on one, one aspect. It's uh, and also there's, it, it's a film. It's a book with a lot of talk in it. And generally speaking, as far as film goes, the less talk, the better. I mean, people should not, do not make long speeches in films. That's what they say with the as well, the apocalypse now. Hmm? That's what they say, we're all in the apocalypse now. Uh, too much talk. Uh -huh. I'd like to see it very much. See what, uh, see what they did with that, uh, that thing. Well, did it have, uh, how many have seen it? Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, yeah. I wondered if it had any uh, actual <coughs> reference, I mean, any, if there was anyone who could be identified as Mr. Kurtz in that. Pardon? They about it. They used yeah. the name Kurtz. Oh, they did? Uh-huh. And this was, uh, but it's actually taking place in Vietnam at the present time. Friend of uh-huh. 
Yeah, yeah, I'd sure like to see that. He's got two endings coming for it. It all comes from Hollywood, about Hollywood. And one's an action ending, and one is the one that was previewed, which is the same thing. Any, uh, yeah. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, I, yes, I thought it was uh, it was uh, creditable. Not bad. Did you see it? Yeah, didn't Hmm. You didn't uh, feel it was successful. Well, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was. Uh, it, it, of course, it wasn't strictly speaking a, a real professional performance, but I thought it uh, was not bad. Pretty good. Any further questions? What yeah. what do you think of all the um, all these codes and Lord Jim like you know he's living by this kind of unexplained code and then at the end he's he is killed kind of by the the natives code and, and Briar loses suicide you know that's kind of a code um, I've been kind of wondering what Conrad was thinking when he put all these open ended Codes of conduct into the book. Yeah, well, he says uh, faith in a fixed code of conduct. Now, uh, this seems, of course, very remote from uh, from the present time. This sort of Victorian codes of conduct, mm -hmm. and um, of course, the specific uh, codes that refer to seamen and as a Briarly says a decent man wouldn't behave like that to a cargo of old rags and bales that he had uh, violated but, uh, but um, I think that um, it goes beyond that I, I don't feel that Conrad is really talking so much about anything as simple as a fixed code of conduct that is a you know seaman um, captain stick, sticking to the ship and all that sort of thing, which, uh, as I say, does seem awfully remote. And uh, next, as I like to talk about the whole concept of the anti-hero, that is the rejection of any fixed code of conduct that you find in, um, you know, in picaresque novels like The Unfortunate Traveler and um, uh, Céline's Journey to the End of the Night. But very much, uh, the whole concept of the hero is very much out of date now. Do you think, is this kind of illustrating the futility of, of all of those? I mean, um, none of them really worked, you know? Well, there are moments. They may have worked at one time, they don't work now. I agree with you, they are very much disillusioned with faith. <laughs> so I said, that aspect, I mean, the whole uh, Victorian of the 19th century codes of conduct are just completely out now. Of course, uh, that's very important in Lord Jim. It's not nearly, it's not very important in Great Gatsby. There doesn't seem to be any fixed codes of conduct there, except um, very superficial and, and snobbish ideas expressed by uh, Tom Buchanan as to how people should behave.
and so I say to how um, how seriously uh, Conrad himself took these codes, it's uh, difficult to say. But I think the uh, the phrase "he was one of us" does not just is not nearly as simple as referring to the fact that he's a you know a, um, a good seaman and uh, um, abides by the code of. Uh, seamen and uh, sticking to the ship and performing their duties and all that sort of thing. It's something more. Nor is Jim's code of conduct ever made uh, very clear as to why he thinks all this is so important, but obviously he does. questions? Well, no, I think we'll disband this evening. Pardon? Oh, uh, I'll cover a lot of material on Friday. I'll speak uh, briefly under, uh, about under-Western eyes, and then the whole concept of the anti-hero as opposed to the hero concept in um, Conrad in the uh, Lord Jim and the Great Gatsby. I'll be talking about um, um, Jane Bowles, Denton Welch, uh, and um, Journey at the End of the Night and Death in the Installment Plan by um, Celine. And um, then um, in the on Monday, I, I want to go through this whole list and uh, comment on uh, you know, the reasons for all the, these books uh, being on the list. So I'll, I'll be talking mostly about the concept of the antihero in the next lecture, as illustrated by Jane Bowles, by uh, Denton Welch, and by um, Celine.